topic is, uh, or the title of my paper is Secularism is Magic. And um, I just want to run through a, a couple of uh, theories on uh, the secular, uh, because our series is called the, the post-secularism, or what is it, the post-secular. Um, and so, so we have to know what it is uh, post, off. Uh, and um, I come from the social sciences, or basically from the humanities and the social sciences. I studied Sanskrit and I studied anthropology, so most, most science are Hindi. But you see, the social sciences have uh, formulated to some extent uh, the ideology of modern times by saying it's a law, a uh, kind of social law of secularization. Uh, so, uh, one thing uh, we are doing, I think, is um, looking at that uh, uh, social science idea of secularization and say, well, we have to rethink that by uh, looking at the post-secular. Now, the secularization thesis is part of uh, what is called the modernization th uh, theory. Modernization theories are uh, coming up, actually, in the United States, mostly, uh, after the Second World War when America gets a hegemony in the world, um, it uh, has uh, ideas about how other people are lagging behind and how America can have a leadership in transforming the rest of the world in uh, uh, the direction of modernity. A whole series of, of series connected to it, and a whole series of pro projects, for example in the 1950s, uh, uh, you have uh, project at the University of Chicago, led by uh, uh, Clifford Kurtz and, uh, and APTA, um, called um, a New Nations Old States, or Old Societies, and uh, arguing about uh, the need to, uh, for these new independent uh, states in uh, Africa and Asia to move from um, primordial identities of ethnicity, religion, kinship and all that, tribalism into a modern world in which civic identity would be, uh, would be central. So a kind of opposition between the modern and the traditional and uh, the need uh, for all these places to modernize. Now, one central element of those modernization theories which have there also a political salience um, uh, is secular, secularization, the so-called secularization thesis. Uh, the secularization thesis entails uh, the following elements, uh, privatization of religion, so it becomes a private affair, so you can become a member of a church like you are a member of a hockey uh, club, um, uh, a kind of uh, differentiation in uh, social spheres, and within these differentiation of social spheres in a society, in a modern society, uh, Religion is not any more dominant, it is only one of the spheres uh, next to the economy, uh, politics, uh, science of course, and it is marginal uh, within it. And then, um, of course, the, uh, the kind of historical or teleological idea of decline. Uh, so it is uh, privatized, it is marginalized, and it declines. That is the uh, teleology of, uh, of uh, secularization. And there's a lot of work on this, uh, an enormous body of sociological work on it. But basically, if you look at it, it doesn't fit anything. Uh, so if you, for example, look at the Netherlands, um, uh, the Netherlands is modernizing, of course, in the 19th century, just like England and other places. It becomes industrial, it becomes an industrial society, and so on. It gets modern politics, it gets a, a, a democratic policy. But religion continues to be very central uh, in economic terms, in political terms, in social terms, in any terms one can imagine, uh, till the 1960s. So it's not the modernization as such that creates uh, decline of religion, marginalization, etc. So uh, close to home, it doesn't work. Whereas, of course, the Netherlands and England are of, uh, the prime examples of modernization theory, uh, because these are the most modern places. Western Europe is always the most modern place. Other places are always lagging behind a little bit. So, in the, in the prime case, it doesn't work. Uh, 
Then, of course, what many people have been noticing is that um, there has been a decline of, uh, of religion uh, in uh, the Netherlands and in many other places after, uh, basically after the Second World War, in some places a little bit quicker than, than in others. But in Western Europe, you have had a, a decline. But um, uh, modernization is not uh, the causal theory we can use. So we have to look at other things. And uh, maybe the welfare state would be an example. Uh, uh, so welfare provision is not anymore uh, uh, kind of provided by churches, by, but by the state. That is often uh, seen by sociologists as one, one element. Um, at the same time, people have been pointing out that the United States, uh, which we may call a modern society, uh, the, uh, is certainly one of the richest uh, states in the world, um, and uh, it's a leader in, uh, in political terms, so it's the, uh, it's the leading power in the world, then the United States uh, does not have anything which resembles this um, uh, secularization theory. So the, the United States uh, shows uh, another element of uh, the secular and the religious, namely uh, that it has made a division between uh, church and state in its, uh, in its origins. Uh, so the American Revolution, uh, as the French Revolution, have a uh, emphasis on uh, on a strict separation, uh, the wall of separation, as it is called in America, between uh, church and state. But that has not uh, created a secularization of society. Uh, churches are very powerful. Uh, actually, they also make use of modern means, as it were, modern uh, technologies like uh, television, etc. So, in short. Um, one of the key elements in uh, sociological uh, modernization theory, namely the secularization thesis, doesn't work at all. Um, then it, there is another element. Uh, I think that is, it, it is still important to establish that. Uh, because basically, as a kind of common sense theory, it lives on. There is an idea that modern people are not religious that modern societies are not religious. And so that to be modern is to be not religious. But we have to recognize that as an ideology. And as a way, in a way as a self-fulfilling prophecy if you have a leadership of, of uh, secularist uh, intellectuals. Uh, so it doesn't fit actually the data, but it fits uh, a particular project, one may say. And I think that is still important to point out. Now, another element of uh, the opposition between the secular and uh, religion in the 19th century is uh, the opposition between religion and magic. Um, magic uh, is, uh, is seen as uh, a false science. So people have rational beliefs, but they are actually uh, not able to create actually scientific proof, etc. So people believe in miracles believe in things which can be proven to be false. You can even extend this to allopathic medicine. Uh, there's always an interesting debate uh, among uh, scientists and scholars about the place of allopathic medicine. Allopathic medicine, many people swear by it, but they think that it's wonderful. But uh, scientists often say this is all bogus. So it's a false science. So it's actually a magical a rather successful magical thing in our modern society. So the opposition very strongly drawn in, uh, at the end of the 19th century by anthropologists and uh, students of religion is uh, religion versus magic, and magic uh, as a false science. Um, that uh, is often argued to also decline, gradually by the uh, uh, kind of uh, onslaught of um, science. So science becomes so, uh, so successful and uh, so powerful that magic uh, becomes marginal. That is a general, uh, general story. Uh, and it is a duty, a moral duty of scientists also to better magical beliefs. Now this idea is very uh, well expressed by uh, a famous uh, sociologist uh, Max Weber um, in uh, thesis on uh, what he calls Entzauberung, uh, disenchantment, the disenchantment of the world, and um, he said, well, we don't get an Entgötterung, 
you don't get a secularization, and it's maybe also not actually uh, desirable that we get an end cut that we get a and so on. And that is, uh, he has some misgivings about the uh, kind of uh, onslaught of science and rationality because he sees also uh, in, uh, in other spheres, like in the bureaucracy, uh, certain elements of rationalization which he finds deplorable. And which people like uh, Sigmund Bauman have said uh, are the basis of uh, the Holocaust because you have a kind of bureaucratic rationality without any moral content. So he has some misgivings about rationalization, but he thinks that that is the world historical approach. Um, now, I think uh, therefore that what we get in the uh, uh, end of the 19th century, in a whole range of theories, and I mean this is not an undergraduate course, so we don't have to uh, say, uh, deal with all these names, but there are a lot of thinkers who make a distinction between magic and religion. And they see uh, religion as a source of uh, morality. As a so and uh, uh, gradually also they look at uh, religions and world religions as uh, sources of universal morality. Uh, the concept of world religion only emerges uh, late in the 19th century here in the Netherlands uh, and also in England. Uh, and then spreads uh, all over the world uh, uh, so that we now use it just as a common sense word uh, through courses uh, on world religions in the United States uh, since the 1920s. Uh, but the concept of world religion actually is a concept in which religion is purified from its anti-scientific magical elements but is a moral uh, uh, resource people uh, can draw from the morality, the moral uh, content of religion and uh, act as uh, responsible citizens and responsible people in the world. So religion actually um, becomes something new, uh, something which is, uh, has a universal um, uh, salience and is comparable to each other. Uh, so uh, you get indeed the uh, new discipline of comparative religion uh, and this, uh, the argument is that uh, religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and uh, Islam and Christianity are all uh, seen as uh, uh, yeah, equal, on equal footing. They, um, they all belong to uh, uh, the world of universal morality. There's some competition between them, some are a little bit more moral than others as well. Uh, so Christianity is often seen as a little bit more uh, accomplished in uh, moral terms, but basically the whole thing is uh, uh, very much alike. There's quite a bit of debate about the status of Islam at the end of the 19th century. Islam is seen as, uh, yeah, as a global religion. <laughs> it's hard to say that it's not a world religion. But to say, well, that it is at the same moral footing as Christianity is really hard to do, uh, seemingly, at the end of the 19th century and still at uh, the beginning of the 21st century, it seems to be quite hard to do. So Buddhism is much more fun. Uh, Buddhism is often seen as much more um, uh, eligible to these, the status of universal morality. And this continues to the present day. Uh, the Dali, as I call him, the Dalai Lama, is, is seen as a kind of smiling, pleasant uh, source of morality against the uh, unsmiling, uh, terrible Chinese. And uh, that is a, a, a set of ideas about uh, Buddhism which uh, have its origin in the 19th century. Like much of our ideas actually uh, have their uh, source there. So we get all kinds of big scholarly projects like the sacred books of the East. Uh, editions of the text of these uh, different uh, traditions and they are all becoming religion. Now, what happens to magic? Uh, now, Weber, as I said, uh, uh, saw it as a, uh, something that which would gradually decline with the rationalization and intellectualization of the world. He, of course, he sees the origins of that already in Protestantism. Uh, so there is a, a gradual uh, world historical process of rationalization of, uh, 
of religion, and uh, in which uh, magic becomes much more and more marginal. Other thinkers of the 19th century who are important for us today uh, uh, have a little bit more. Um, uh, they see all kinds of complications uh, in this. Uh, of course, Marx uh, thinks about the fetish uh, and uh, fetishization as a as an element of alienation from the world. So um, uh, when we see a thing, when we see a table, we uh, are alienated enough to uh, not recognize the label which went into it and uh, the people who have made it. So we, we make an enormous distinction between things and man, between human beings and, and objects, and uh, 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 we uh, are alienated from the uh, relations of production. That creates a fetishization of, of the object. And uh, this kind of idea has been, uh, of course, influential in our thinking about money, uh, and it has been very influential in our thinking about uh, uh, consumption and consumerism. Uh, so the, uh, our relation to, uh, to the world of things uh, doesn't seem to completely become rational or rational. Of course, uh, Marx has the idea that a socialist um, uh, world would then solve it. Uh, so if we can uh, move from capitalism into socialism, uh, that alienation would be solved. But let's put it like that, we have not seen that happening. And so, so uh, this is a kind of utopia which uh, has had all kinds of effects except, except for uh, uh, creating that utopia. Uh, the Freudian idea about the fetish, uh, about our magical relationship to our desires, uh, uh, also is quite influential in our thinking about uh, ob about objects and uh, the nature of the, of the relation between uh, uh, personhood and, uh, and objects. Uh, also, there is a, of course, a belief that um, uh, that there should be a rational eye uh, instead of uh, this. Uh, some, the, the, the desiring eye, and uh, so there is also a, an idea that the magic uh, of the world, the magic of objects, uh, should be brought under control. Uh, and then Durkheim, uh, the sociologist, um, uh, points out that um, uh, the fetish has a, uh, a kind of effect of co social cohesion, of, uh, of binding people together. So he points at the flag, for example, and, about, and he points at national currency, in which we, uh, in God we trust, or uh, in a kind of symbol of uh, some uh, transcendental uh, unity, uh, we actually have to trust, uh, otherwise uh, we will not be employed, we won't buy uh, our houses, we won't get prizes, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the flag and the state uh, are important in, uh, in Durkheim's thinking about the fetish. And, um, and the idea that, there is, uh, the, that the state is an empty signifier, that there is all kinds of projections into the power of the state, and that that has a magical uh, uh, strength uh, over us. Um, so that the, uh, all the election processes and the idea of democracy is based on the rational exchange of ideas, what you have in people like Habermas, etc is actually only part of the story. The other story is that enormous investment in, uh, in the symbols of, uh, of power. And um, so these, these arguments, these 19th century arguments, uh, basically point at the possibility that uh, magic is actually not disappearing. That uh, like the other story about secularization in the disappearance of religion, uh, we basically may, have, may see all kinds of transformation of transformation of magic in the world, but not uh, the disappearance of it. And um, uh, I think, therefore, that the post-secular uh, points out at the, uh, the role of fantasy, of uh, collective fantasies, of uh, populism, etc., all these elements which uh, are the uh, other side of, uh, of human beings, not only the rational side.
So what I think I, I could argue now uh, about um, about Europe, about European thought, uh, and of course we can go uh, into uh, modern installments of this, but basically I always think that a lot of this stuff is 19th century ideas. And um, that there is uh, uh, a sharp distinction between religion and mag magic, religion as a source of morality, and magic as a, uh, uh, a false science. And, uh, but a false science and a false knowledge which makes people tick, uh, which uh, creates desires, uh, which uh, mobilizes people, uh, which um, uh, also fuels uh, the economy uh, through consumption and therefore has an enormous role to play. Um, but it has to be brought under control, as it were, uh, by the state, uh, by, uh, by rational politics, by the Now these ideas are of course uh, European or Western, etc., uh, but they are brought to the rest of the world. And in fact, if I could make the argument a little bit longer, I think they are created in relation to the rest of the world. Uh, I've never thought that European modernity was a product of Europe itself. It's a, it's a product of Europe in relation to uh, Europe's others. And it's uh, especially in these thinking about magic that it, that the internal others, the, the idea of witchcraft, etc., which uh, is constantly attacked already by the Roman Catholic Church, but also uh, all these Protestant uh, attacks of these uh, of witchcraft things and magical things. So an enormous attack on popular beliefs, etc., by uh, religious institutions, uh, which is taken over uh, by the state in a later uh, in a later phase of modernization. But there are also these external uh, factors these religions and traditions one is encountered with uh, in the rest of the world. That's where Marx, Freud and Durkheim get their idea of the fetish from, right? The, the fetish, uh, feticho, is a, uh, an African uh, confrontation with uh, Portuguese and Dutch uh, traders and it's basically an idea of an encounter with forces uh, still a uh, in the Dutch uh, uh, allow me a kind of reference to our Dutch literature, these kinds of elements in Indonesia and Africa, etc., which one encounters, and which are brought into uh, a particular kind of play, uh, namely to say that uh, uh, these magical elements are the reason why these um, uh, societies uh, are backwards, uh, lag behind. Uh, so they are not rational enough. Uh, they still believe in miracles. Um, so miracles have to be uh, marginalized. This is also, I think, the uh, topic of William James' uh, uh, varieties of religious experience. Uh, uh, the miracle has to be uh, replaced by the religious hypothesis. So the confrontation with the rest of the world is very much in terms of uh, are there elements in the religious traditions we encounter that are moral, that can contribute to universal mor mor morality, which therefore can be part of a modern world. And other elements in it which have to be declined, which have to be battled, which are, which are backward, which are also the so sources of backwardness. Um, and this we can, can find in the confrontation with Islam, we can uh, find it, uh, say, in Snoopy when he goes to Indonesia, uh, with uh, lots of writers about Egypt, etc. We can also find it uh, in all the confrontations with Hinduism and, and so forth, uh, and so on and so forth in, uh, in the Asian religions. Now, one of the um, difficulties of that encounter was that one has to identify what religion is in these places. Uh, basically, um, one has to make a kind of cognitive and uh, uh, also powerful attempt to create religion because in all these places people don't call it religion, it has to be translated and they don't quite know what these Europeans mean with it. Europeans mostly mean uh, a, a kind of institution, a set of 
uh, institutions and uh, uh, a unified set of uh, doctrines in which people believe. So the concept of belief becomes very central in the encounter with, uh, with the rest of the world. So do they believe in something positive or do they believe in something negative? Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that whole process uh, in which actually all these so-called Eastern religions are created, like so-called Confucianism, Taoism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, these things did, did not exist in the same way before the 19th century. There were traditions uh, in, in China, in China, they are called Jiao teachings. Um, uh, in India, you have the idea of Dharma, a kind of law, of a kind of order of the world. Uh, in China, you also have the idea of Tao, of a kind of order of the world. Um, all these traditions, which uh, are encountered in the imperial phase, um, uh, have to be transformed into religion into these moral sources, the unities of um, morality. Um, and my argument would be that uh, this is a process that is at the same time also taking place in Europe. Uh, in Europe, it becomes, religion becomes part of the idea of the nation. Uh, religion becomes part of a moral source of nationalism. And uh, is nationalized, as it were. And in all these other places, um, Nationalism has to, uh, anti-colonial nationalism has to uh, think itself in terms of what are we going to do with religion? Are we going to make it into a source of our resistance? Uh, or are we uh, going to reject it? Now, I will say a bit about the, um, the Chinese case. Uh, I have written uh, also uh, a lot about the the Indian case in, uh, in work on religious nationalism in India. But the Chinese case is, is also interesting and is actually interesting also for some other reasons um, uh, which uh, we may reflect on. Um, I think one thing which, uh, which I have already said is the transformation of uh, being, uh, uh, religious ideas and practices uh, in terms of codified religions. This is something which has to happen in, uh, in China and in India. There's a wonderful story about um, something what is called uh, the World Parliament of Religions, uh, set together, uh, put together by the uh, Unitarian uh, Christians in 1893 in Chicago, in which representatives of all religions are asked to uh, present their religion in a kind of world power. Um, that they therefore need, first of all, representatives of these, these religions. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, uh, in the terms of, in, in, in Catholicism we have the Pope, but for the rest we don't have much as a representative. Um, when you don't have churches, you don't have representatives. So it's really uh, a complex business anyway. But uh, for Confucianism, uh, they uh, ask the um, Chinese, uh, a member of the Chinese delegation in, uh, in Washington, a, uh, a Qing dynasty uh, official uh, to represent Confucianism. So first of all, he doesn't quite know what it is. Uh, and secondly, he thinks, well, if it is what you think it is, uh, namely the teachings of, uh, of, the, of Ru, of all these uh, uh, kind of intellectuals who come after uh, Kong, Kung Fu and uh, who have some comments on them, so a, a tradition of commentary basically, um, uh, and the ritual uh, of the imperial court, which is partly based on it. Um, if that is it, what you mean, then it is not a religion, because religion is actually something what you have, namely a form of shamanism. Uh, he thinks that. Uh, the Chinese are more civilized than uh, Western Christians. He thinks that the Christians have uh, something which is, is in which uh, rituals are performed to gain some kind of uh, uh, result. 
and uh, are actually not uh, uh, primarily moral. So we have here a kind of little inversion of the uh, general uh, uh, situation in which uh, the Western world determines what is moral in those uh, other, um, uh, in, in the Asian religion. You have a reversal in the sense that uh, an Asian person says, well, what, do, what we find in Christianity is actually something very primitive, shamanism, uh, sham possession cults, uh, which uh, we have left behind already for a very long time. So this is a, uh, a, a particular uh, kind of uh, exchange uh, showing how uh, complicated this process is. But at the same time, the Chinese more and more are forced to think about uh, their traditions in terms of a moral source for nation building. Uh, they actually look more at Japan than at any other and in Japan there is a successful uh, up, uh, upgrading of uh, local practices, namely Shinto practices, to a form of a state cult called Shintoism, uh, in which the emperor is the central figure and in which uh, all kinds of military values are seen as belonging to the spiritual core of the Japanese people. That is something which uh, the Chinese also would like to have. Um, so there are attempts to create a, uh, a Confucian religion, a, uh, a cult of Confucian. This is new. Uh, it didn't uh, exist before. And uh, it is a product of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And people um, uh, try to therefore to make a religion into something in which um, uh, the Chinese uh, can create a certain kind of social cohesion and a kind of source of a nationalist morality. Now that uh, is not very successful, I must say, uh, because people seem to also to be mobilized to actually believe in something. If you if you create a cult, uh, you can just not do it from uh, any kind of top-down version. It's really difficult to do. It's a little bit like in the French uh, Revolution when they started to do secular rituals, etc. Right? Uh, uh, there have been all these attempts to uh, also create another calendar, etc. If there's not, so, not much support from the people, the Russians have also done that. They're really difficult to do. So basically this has not been uh, entirely successful. But what the Chinese have done is uh, is uh, create organized religions uh, that in a way imitate Western religion. So they have uh, created associations, religious associations, with a leadership and with um, a, certi a certified uh, set of rituals, almost a catechism, and a control of practices uh, in which uh, a clear boundary is drawn between practices which are belonging to the creed and which do not belong to the creed. So basically a kind of solidifying uh, of, uh, of Chinese religions in imitation of Western religion. This is the same process we see in, uh, in India and in other places too. Um, so they have created what is um, basically uh, uh, Western theory they have created religions which are a positive source for belonging to the nation. And really very important. And an enormous transformation. Uh, it also uh, uh, enables the state to control these associations, which already was the case in, uh, in nationalist China uh, before the communist takeover in 1949, uh, and has become even uh, stronger after 19. So uh, they become state apparatuses in currency's uh, terms, right? They uh, become uh, basically uh, apparatuses through which you can exert control over the people. But they have done something else too, um, uh, which is the magic sign of our, uh, of our story. Uh, they have attacked popular religion. Popular religion, 
being seen as magical, superstitious. Uh, they have also a, a word for that, uh, I mean she, uh, superstitious uh, practices of the people. These were seen as obstacles to progress, to modernization. They had to be eradicated. So while you don't see secularization in China, like you do not see it anywhere else, you do see something which is called secularism, as you do see it everywhere else. Namely, an ideology carried by intellectuals uh, which is strongly anti certain kinds of practices and ideas of common people. And uh, the view that these practices and beliefs and uh, ideas are obstacles to rational progress. Also the idea that people are deluded by their priests, etc. and so on. So basically uh, get rid of them, uh, of the clergy who are involved in that. Uh, we have seen that in the French Revolution very strongly that anti-clericalism uh, the, the clergy is seen not only as, um, as deluding the people, but also, of course, uh, the borscht. Is that a good uh, uh, English? Uh, so <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, all kinds of uh, sexual transgressions are always uh, connected to the clergy. And this is very similar to uh, what you find in the French Enlightenment. Uh, uh, say the, uh, the pornography connected to the clergy as an uh, anti-clerical um, uh, attack. Same in China, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. But much more than in France, a secularist attack on the establishment of popular religion. So, uh, between 1900 and 1920, uh, a million temples have been destroyed. There is a uh, Chinese uh, slogan at the end of the 19th century, Hui uh, Miao Banshu, uh, which means uh, they destroy uh, temples and uh, build schools. Uh, more secularism you can't get, right? So, so you uh, have a clear preference to schools and universities above, uh, above, uh, above temples and religious institutions. It's a bit similar to also the idea in England uh, that one has to get rid of um, Oxford and Cambridge as clerical establishment but make it into real um, scientific institutions. So, um, the similarities are there. Now, what are the sources of this very strong secularist attack? And I think, uh, I, I give you the Chinese case. Yeah, that's partly irrelevant for you because you are working on China, etc. But China is a big part of the world and uh, uh, we've talked a lot about the West always, so it's not, not uh, not completely irrelevant to talk about it, uh, but it's also interesting uh, because it shows some general patterns. Um, I think secularism as an ideological pro uh, project is a very interesting thing to look at, and it, is, it has many forms, but it is uh, uh, much more important than uh, the idea of secularization. So what are the sources of this kind of anti-clericalism and secularism in China? Now, first of all, I think Protestantism. Uh, you have Protestant uh, missionaries uh, active after the Opium Wars of 1840s uh, coming into China and basically attacking all the practices of the people, and I said, by, uh, calling them memory, uh, just uh, stupid uh, practices, magical practices. Um, there's also a very interesting kind of uh, Protestant idea that uh, kneeling or is called in Chinese Kato, that you go entirely on your forehead uh, in worshipping uh, images, is an abomination. Uh, and uh, you have at the, at the end of the 18th century a famous uh, mission from the, uh, from the English king to China, uh, the McCartney uh, mission, in which uh, the English king wants to establish diplomatic relations with the uh, Qing emperor. And the uh, McCartney, the uh, leader of the delegation, uh, refuses to touch his, to, to make this, to touch his forehead to the ground, or even to kneel or whatever, because uh, he would not kneel, or he would, uh, no, would not bow, bow deeper than before the uh, English king. But there's a strong sense that this is a form of slavery, a form of uh, uh, 
uh, humiliation or self-humiliation. Uh, and it's basically part of the anti-Catholic uh, propaganda uh, that you find in Protestantism from the beginning. So anti-popery, yeah. Uh, uh, so there is a, a strong uh, sense that what the Chinese do is a form of magical superstition and memory, meaningless rituals in which they uh, lose their individuality and um, uh, become totally enslaved uh, under the power of the emperor. Now, people who know a little bit about Hegel's uh, Weltgeschichte uh, would immediately recognize Hegel's picture of, uh, of China. Uh, why there cannot be a rationality in China, why there cannot be, uh, why the Weltgeist uh, is, in, uh, is better in Europe than not uh, by India or China. Rationality is not possible in this place where you don't have individual rationality. Um, and I see that basically as a Protestant view. Um, so that is an, uh, a major source. Um, but then also uh, the nature of modern missionary action in, uh, in China. And this is similar everywhere in the world. Uh, missionaries create schools, hospitals and welfare organizations. And uh, so they take care of orphans and all. Um, in that sense, they mobilize and create civil society uh, in places where there is no civil society. So that is a modernizing uh, uh, element. Um, through that, um, through the uh, creation of these institutions, you will have a, um, uh, a growth of the laity, the, uh, uh, a greater importance of a middle class laity. That means an informed uh, uh, sacred books reading public uh, emerges, which becomes central in all these places. This is all over, but also in the Islamic world, you, you find uh, exactly the same pattern. So there's a kind of imitation uh, uh, of uh, Protestant organizations that we find in the transformation of these uh, Chinese religions, Indian religions, and, uh, and Islam. Basically, there is a not so much a conversion to uh, Christianity, but a conversion to modernity that happens in, uh, in these places through modern institutions like schools, etc. This is the basis of creating religions as a moral source, as a source of the nation. It's also the basis of nationalism. And uh, uh, so uh, building schools instead of temples is uh, very much what the Protestants also were doing. Uh, so and that's, that, that follows therefore a, a Protestant argument. So I think Protestantism is very important in it. Orientalism is very important in it. Um, and it I mentioned already the sacred books of the East. Um, so the creation of a canon, which we also have in the Netherlands, uh, uh, a creation of a set of books which are the basis of our identity or, or what the religion is about. These things were not available. There are no canons. Uh, there are texts on which people have comments, but they are uh, mostly very much uh, part of a specialist audience. Uh, so the creation of a canon, which is the basis of those religions. So you get a Buddhist canon, you get a Tao canon, you get uh, a Confucian canon, a Hindu text. You have to see how important that is, that uh, these things were not available. They are uh, created by Westerners, by Western Orientalists in the 19th century. And this is uh, what uh, one of a colleague of mine uh, has called a mask of conquest. Uh, I think uh, no, nothing of bad intention, no, this is all very positive. I'm in, I'm in, uh, totally in favor of imperialism. But this is, uh, this is part of what it is. It, it is a total transformation. So you cannot imagine, say, Taoist association before, say, 1900. It's, it's just not thinkable. And uh, so this is, this is happening on the religious side. But on the magic side of things, uh, there's a straightforward attack. Uh, so popular religion is repressed uh, everywhere. And in a big way. I mean, not, uh, not a few monasteries or something. No. And also not a short period, as in the uh, French Revolution. It was a short period. And France became Catholic after sin, right? So, but, but here, really, one century of attack. Um, now, uh, 
has that been successful? Has it been possible to uh, eradicate magic, eradicate superstition, eradicate, uh, uh, say, popular religion in China? Now, you have um, uh, what I would call the return of the repressed in all kinds of elements. Uh, so, for example, uh, one more, uh, nice historical example is uh, in the 1930s, uh, the attempt by a nationalist, the Kuomintang, the nationalist in China, to repress the ghost festival. Because these ghosts do not exist, and while they, uh, they are hungry ghosts, you have to feed them, etc. But it's a big festival, part of the, uh, the spring festival. And uh, it has to do with ancestor worship. So ghost festival had to be repressed, according to uh, uh, secularists of the uh, Nationalist Party, who were partly also Christian. Uh, and um, they don't succeed in it. And one reason for it, why they don't exceed, is actually the growing popularity of ghosts. Because China is going through a period of famines, uh, through a period of, uh, of uh, warfare, um, a lot of civil war, of course, uh, the Japanese are coming in, uh, in Manchukuo, in Manchuria. Uh, there is actually a lot of debt and death. Well, when you have a lot of death, then you have a lot of ghosts. And uh, you have also a lot of relations with the people who have just died. And, uh, and in fact, you have a kind of tension with the needs of the moment and this kind of secularist attack on popular religion. Um, this is also, again, very similar to what we see in Europe uh, in the, uh, after the American Civil War uh, in America. Uh, in the American Civil War, you have uh, all these spirits um, uh, uh, worshipped stuff, uh, all the spiritualism, uh, uh, all an enormous interest in trying to get into contact with ghosts, etc., because so many people have died in the Civil War. The First World War in Europe uh, was a big example of uh, an enormous popularity of ghosts and of spiritualism in the sense of uh, uh, getting in connection with, uh, with spirits. So there's a return of the repressed in that sense, that you uh, have to deal with certain things like death, and that uh, you have to replace those dealings with what you have to deal with by something else. And if you don't have that, then basically uh, there is a continuation of it. So basically, ancestor uh, in the cultural revolution, uh, they have tried to eradicate um, uh, ancestor worship. Basically, this is not doable. It's really hard to do. So I mean, in that sense, there's a return of the repress. Then there is something like modern consumption. Uh, uh, in places like Shanghai, etc., you get from the 1910s, 1920s, um, uh, all kinds of, you get the kind of uh, the Paris of the East, as it were. Uh, all kinds of modern consumption patterns in which magic plays a role. Uh, you get in China the enormous popularity of uh, movies in which magic is important. Uh, Sometimes they are these fighting movies, uh, Shaolin movies, uh, fighting monks, etc. Uh, uh, but there's a whole range of practices uh, in which also Tao uh, masters are uh, quite uh, important. So you get a kind of modern magic that connected to modern consumption. Now that is eradicated by the communists in 1949. So Shanghai becomes really a marginal place, all the capital flees to Hong Kong and Shanghai becomes a kind of second rate uh, city, not a cosmopolitan city of the 1920s and 1930s. But then Maoism itself actually takes over a lot of the elements of uh, popular magic. You can have a kind of deification of Mao, uh, the idea that uh, Mao can heal, uh, the idea that um, the enemies of the the state are uh, in fact uh, uh, witches, uh, that there is, uh, so there are all kinds of anti-witchcraft movements uh, connected to, uh, 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 to Maoism and of course again you have a lot of dead people. Uh, so in the Great Forward, uh, 30 million people are killed, um, the Cultural Revolution has uh, several million uh, killed. So basically, um, uh, there are all kinds of elements in which 
uh, Maoism has to deal with popular energy, as I would call them, popular uh, uh, power, uh, uh, to mobilize people and to deal with the suffering uh, they encounter. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, there are several elements in the uh, Cultural Revolution and also earlier in several of the campaigns against anti-rightism, etc., uh, which uh, are very similar to uh, ideas on popular religion. In the North. So basically you have on the one hand a secularist attack on popular religion, an idea of the control of religion as moral sources of nationalism, but of course, in political action itself, as Durkheim uh, already stated, in political action itself, you have the energies which you have tried to repress. Uh, and that seems to be uh, a, uh, an important element in the understanding of Maoism. It's not entirely secular in that sense. Uh, it is also partaking in that what it tries to, tries to repress. Now, a, a very strong and interesting example of that is, um, is the support of the Communist Party of something which is called Qigong. Uh, so all these um, uh, uh, yes, uh, breathing exercises, uh, one can call them, uh, which, are, which have their roots uh, in, uh, in the Ming period and uh, uh, are partly Buddhist, are partly uh, Taoist. Uh, have therefore a long tradition, uh, sort of kind of self cultivation through the control of breath. You find that also in yoga and in India, for example, similar ideas. Uh, and Qigong uh, is taken in the 1950s by the party as a cheap means of uh, medical care. It is seen as by, by the party as, um, as, a, uh, as a science. And I think that is the crucial element. I have already said that magic is anti-science, uh, but the party um, uh, uh, th therefore can only uh, adopt these older traditions, which are what one can call magical or uh, traditional, uh, by calling them science, by, by seeing them as, uh, as instances of uh, modern rationality. Therefore, you get a lot of experiments also in physics, uh, in the natural sciences, to sh show what kind of physic uh, energy qi is, which the Western scientists have not been able to uh, discover. Uh, the father of the nuclear program in China uh, is a uh, devout believer of qigong and of uh, the existence, the scientific existence of qi as a kind of cosmic energy uh, which can be used also at the, the private le level for, for health purposes. So uh, very simple, um, I do some of these uh, exercises myself. Uh, there is the idea that you get uh, better hearing uh, uh, when you uh, do these exercises. I must say uh, this doesn't really work. <laughs> but it is, uh, it seems to be very healthy. <laughs> So health and, 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 and science, these are the elements uh, which is, are taken on by the, uh, taken on by the party. It's also cheap, of course, right? Uh, allopathic medicine is much more expensive. So it's also very much related to the, these uh, bare food doctors of the 1950s in Maoism. Uh, so a cheap medical care for uh, large groups of people. Uh, Qigong is, is part of that uh, whole idea. Now, uh, so here you have what you could say uh, a set of popular practices which are kind of unified and codified into uh, uh, something which can be taught to other people and which can be experimented on uh, uh, and which, are, which, which is adopted by the secularist uh, Communist Party uh, and organized in, in associations. Now, uh, this stuff becomes suddenly, uh, after 1980, very, very popular in China. Uh, it becomes popular after 1978, after Deng Xiaoping uh, announces that uh, basically uh, the real Maoist period is over, uh, the Cultural Revolution is over, uh, we will now have uh, uh, 
a socialism is Chinese uh, characteristic, which is basically the capitalism is uh, Chinese characteristic. And so when you have the liberalization and opening up of China, and um, uh, Qigong becomes enormously popular. Millions of people start doing it in parks and uh, in public spaces, etc. Party is not against that. It just wants to control this enthusiasm of the people. Because basically, even people become too enthusiastic, as you know, then you have to control them. And otherwise, they may do all the kinds of things you don't want. Uh, so they try to, uh, to channel all this uh, enthusiasm. This is called Qigong Le, uh, fever, uh, Qigong fever. There's a kind of hotness to it. And uh, out of this, uh, some really popular move movements come up. And one of them is, uh, is called the Falun Gong. Uh, and you may have heard of the Falun Gong. Uh, a big movement uh, in, in China which uh, emerges at the beginning of the 90s. It's very much supported in the beginning by the party and then infiltrates into the party and becomes really very popular uh, among the party members, also in the military, and then starts to become a threat to the Communist Party. Because it, according to the Communist Party, it has more members than the party itself. Uh, so then it goes out of hand in the sense that uh, uh, the leader of this uh, particular uh, form of Qigong, uh, a man called Li Hongzhi, uh, uh, starts arguing that he is actually an incarnation of the Buddha and that he, has, uh, he uh, uh, is able to show the people the way to a better life, uh, a new utopian life, uh, a paradise on earth. Uh, a, uh, a, a life uh, without all the trials and tribulations of capitalism with uh, Chinese uh, characteristics in which there is no social security anymore in which people are completely actually uh, uh, shaken into uh, and shaped into uh, capitalist cons cons consumption and capitalist competition uh, a move into a other moral world and um, uh, a world which would be uh, uh, devoid of the Communist Party. So it becomes an anti-Communist Party uh, uh, movement. Partly also already because uh, this is a kind of dynamic at which the Communist Party starts to uh, try to control it and start to repress it, etc. And then the other party, become, the, the Falun Gong, becomes more and more, uh, say, aggressive and more and more uh, assertive in its pronunciations uh, around. This all collapses in 1998 uh, uh, when uh, Falun Gong adherents uh, come to uh, Beijing to protest against the treatment by the Communist Party of, uh, of members of the Falun Gong. Then everyone is rounded up. The youngster has to uh, flee to uh, Brooklyn in New York, where he is now, and uh, Falun Gong becomes a kind of uh, international uh, uh, movement. Now here you have um, uh, an example of uh, something which was uh, popular in the sense of magical, uh, all kinds of ideas, which are elevated to the status of science, uh, brought under the control of the party, and uh, uh, then goes out of hand and becomes a kind of force uh, against the party. Now, summarizing uh, very quickly uh, my uh, my general argument is that uh, it is worthwhile uh, to forget about uh, the secularization theory except for the idea that secularization theory belongs to an ideology of secularism. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy by intellectuals, which um, uh, also the liberal media, etc., is supporting. And uh, there's only a very small part of the world in which there is something like the decline of religion. Uh, however we define religion. Uh, so basically it is a particular, very particular historical ideology. Now it's not an important ideology, it's important in the West, but it's also important in the rest of the world. And it's certainly important in, uh, in the communist world, in which um, secularism was part of an ideology of actually changing society and uh, transforming it uh, and removing it, uh, removing the obstacles to progress from it. 
And China is one of the most extreme cases, I would say, of attacks on uh, popular uh, religion, on, on magic, uh, and the attempt to bring uh, religion under its control and make it into uh, state apparatuses. Uh, that extreme we don't find anywhere else, but we find examples of it, or uh, instances of it also elsewhere. So it's interesting, I think, to look at secularism as a particular ideology, and then, then the post-secular uh, has to uh, question uh, what kind of ideas are they, and uh, what kind of social effects and social and political effects do they have. That's all. Thank you.